Yeah, amen. The Apostle Paul wrote that even when we are faithless, God is faithful for he cannot deny himself. Isn't it good news that our whole relationship with God is not dependent on my faithfulness, but on thy faithfulness? Ah, it's good. It's good. It's good to, good to sing a hymn, guys. Thanks for that, too. I didn't even really grow up in church and didn't grow up singing hymns, but it's still, you tap into something old and rich and deep when you sing those kind of songs. It's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. I hope you enjoyed getting to hear a few of the uh, blessings of children talking about their moms at the beginning of the uh, gathering. And then, of course, we'll run that a little bit more at the end of the gathering. And for my part, I just want to say to my mom, uh, who moved in next door a couple of years ago, along with my dad, it has been such a delight these last few years to watch you bless my kids and pour into my kids and love my kids. And so I've gotten to see you, mom, being uh, a mother in a way that you were, I am sure, to me, but I never got to see. And so I just appreciate it so much more deeply watching you love my kids now. And the same goes for Amy's mom. They live just five miles down the road and uh, they love our kids too. And Elaine loves our kids so much. And so um, Bethany... Maggie, Jordan, as you're watching this, just know that when you grow up, uh, we are going to move close to you so then we can love on your kids and you can really appreciate us because this is a crazy time to be parenting young kids. Uh, This week we got on a Zoom call and we were just talking to a couple of of our friends and neighbors who also have young kids and we got to telling stories about the craziness that is parenting during staying at home. And one dad was telling the story about how he came inside and he found that his kids had taken a giant commercial roll of construction paper and they started in their basement and they rolled it all the way out to the street and then they brought it back in through the side door all through the house, like literally hundreds of feet of construction paper all the way around making this trail. He's like, what are you guys doing? They're saying, well, we were playing hot lava and we couldn't step on the ground, so we had to walk on the construction paper. Uh, another family, uh, one of the moms on the call, on the Zoom call, just took her laptop because she's sitting in her living room and she turned it around and she started to show us all the debris of the day, you know, after bedtime. There's just toddler clothes and half-filled cups of milk and Hot Wheels everywhere. And then one of the dads on the call, he left and he came back a minute later and he just held up this big, pump bottle of hand soap. And he just looked at us and he said, this is the only soap in our shower right now. It's all we have. Uh, so maybe, maybe you can relate to that, parents. Um, and here's the question. I mean, how many of you parents, moms especially, how, how many of you have found raising humans to be more challenging than you expected. (laughs) I know we are in that camp for sure. And parenting is one of the most humbling things a human being can try to do. And, And humbling things, they have this way of really making us feel inadequate. They shake our confidence and we start to ask, have I worked hard enough? Do I love my kids enough? Am I good enough? Am I enough? And that's the word that we're going to be talking about in Exodus 16. If you have your Bible, you can open to Exodus 16. But that word, enough, it means as much or as many as required. But how do we know? What? is required, how much, how many are required, by whom? How do we know what is enough in our lives? How do we know what's enough for our possessions or our salaries or in our efforts to parent or in our identity? How do we know what's enough? And then we look at the world around us and there are 
big challenges, big problems out there. How will we know when it's safe enough to go back out into everyday life after this pandemic begins to resolve? Or even darker things like this story that's come out this week about Ahmad Arbery, a reminder that there are still dark undercurrents of racism, brutal violence in our society. How, how do we know what's enough in our struggle for equality and justice? And then who sets the standards of enough? Is it, is it what the media says? Is it what social media says? Is it our parents? Is it our friends, coaches, teachers, peers, coworkers, our spouse, our children? How do we know what is enough? And Exodus 16 is a chapter of the Bible that that really is all about that word, enough. And we're talking about these Red Sea resets. God has delivered the people out of bondage. He's leading them into the promised land. And so the first lesson we learned is that the Red Sea, God led them to a dead end. It looked like things were going to go very badly as the chariots of Egypt rode down upon them. But there's this reminder in that passage that God is more concerned with his glory than he is with our relief. And so God is intent on displaying not only his mercy, but also his justice. And that's exactly what happens in the Red Sea story. But then the second reset that we looked at last week is that God gets glory when we get grace. And the people of Israel, when they walk through that Red Sea on dry land and they see the waters come crashing together and wiping out their enemies, they rejoice because they get grace. They understand it. They've grasped that God has rescued them as their mighty warrior. And as they get grace, their hearts erupt in dancing and in song. But now, Exodus 16, reset number three, let God define enough. We'll start in Exodus 16, verse one. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the Sin Desert, which is located between Elam and Sinai. They set out on the 15th day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt. And if you're keeping track, this is one month after the Exodus event. And the whole Israelite community, verse two, complained against Moses and Aaron in the desert. The Israelites said to them, Oh, how we wish that the Lord had just put us to death while we were still in the land of Egypt. There we could sit by the pots cooking meat and eat our fill of bread. Instead, you've brought us out into this desert to starve this whole assembly to death. This reset lesson starts when the Israelites come to the conclusion that they do not have enough. They don't have enough food. And in this case, it is their growling bellies that is determining what is enough. And their complaint, it's almost absurd when you read it. Because this hunger is so intense, they are saying they'd rather go back to slavery where at least they could have bread. Like, I, I don't care if you make me make bricks as long as I get a good seat next to the crock pot when I'm done, the meat pots. And even so, God is very gracious. And in spite of their whining and their grumbling and their murmuring and their complaining, look at verse four, then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to make bread rain down from the sky for you. The people will go out each day and gather just enough for that day. And in this way, I'll test them to see whether or not they follow my instruction. On the sixth day, when they measure out what they have collected, it will be twice as much as they collected on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, this evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, you will see the Lord's glorious presence because your complaints against the Lord have been heard. Who are we? Why blame us? And so then in the story, God appears in the cloud. He says, I've heard your complaint. I will give you meat in the evening, bread in the morning so that you'll know that I am the Lord your God. 
Skip forward to verse 13. In the evening, a flock of quail flew down and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the desert surface were thin flakes, as thin as frost on the ground. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? They didn't know what it was. It's interesting, they'd been living off of the Egyptian food for so long that when the bread of God appeared, they couldn't recognize it. It's also a good thing that God sent the quail at the evening time and the manna in the morning because if he'd sent them both at the same time, there really could have been some confusion about what was manna and what wasn't. Picking up again, verse 15. Moses said to them, this is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Collect as much of it as each of you can eat, one omer per person, and you may collect for the number of people in your household. An omer is like a half gallon. So imagine like a half gallon of milk, you cut the top off. That's how much they're going out and filling with flakes every morning. So the Israelites, verse 17, did as Moses said, some collecting more, some less, but when they measured it out by the omer, the ones who had collected more had nothing left over. And the ones who had collected less had no shortage. Everyone collected just as much as they could eat. And Moses said to them, don't keep any of it until morning. But they did not listen to Moses and some kept part of it until morning, but it became infested with worms and stank. Moses got angry with them. Every morning they gathered it as much as each person could eat, but when the sun grew hot, it melted away. This manna is interesting. And when the Israelites say, what is it? That word in the original language is manna, right? It's like, what is this? And so what they eat every day is, what is this? It comes with the dew. It's small and flaky, sort of like white frost. Over in verse 31, we'll hear that it's sort of like coriander seed. It's white. And Numbers 11 also says it kind of has this shimmery, pearly quality to it. We learn in the book of Numbers that you could grind it, you could pound it flat, then you could cook it, you could boil it, and that the cook, the the cakes that you made out of it really tasted sort of like honey, uh, but you had to get it in the morning before it got hot because it would melt away. But it's also miraculous, right? Because it always ends up being the same amount and it does not keep overnight unless, unless you gather it on the sixth day. So here's what happens in verse 22. On the sixth day, the people collected twice as much food as usual, two omers per person, and all the chiefs of the community came and told Moses, and he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil, but you can set aside and keep all the leftovers until the next morning. So they set the leftovers aside until morning as Moses had commanded. They didn't stink or become infested with worms. And the next day, Moses said, eat it today because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today, you won't find it out in the field. Six days you will gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be nothing to gather. And on the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather bread, but they found nothing. The Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to obey my commandments and instructions? Look, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you enough food for two days. Each of you should stay where you are and not leave your place on the seventh day. And so the people rested on the seventh day. All right, this is a packed story. There is a lot going on. And this story will echo through the rest of the Bible. Later on, people like Asaph in Psalm 78 or Nehemiah in Nehemiah chapter 9, even Jesus will talk about this miracle of the manna in the wilderness quite a bit. So what's the point? What's the reset? What do the people need to learn here in the wilderness? And we go back to verse 4 in our chapter The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to make bread rain down from the sky for you. The people will go out each day and gather just enough, there's our word, enough for that day. In this way, I'll test them to see whether or not they follow my instruction. And so we see this test is about trust. And the trust is all about learning to look to God to provide enough. Learning to let God define and then provide enough. 
And at this point in their journey, as we read, everyone ends up with the same amount. Even though some people strive and hustle to get as much manna as they can, they maximize their manna harvest, that extra effort does not result in extra omers of manna in the tent. And then there are others who don't hustle. Maybe they're even a little slothful. And yet when they get back, God has still made sure they have enough to survive. And for the most part, the people here pass the test. Most people trust God to provide enough for them. But there are two ways, as we read, that some people fail. The first way is the strategy of saving some extra for tomorrow. Why is that? Why would people, even though Moses says, hey, don't try to save extra, like forget about the Ziploc bag, don't worry about the Tupperware, don't throw it in the fridge, just, just we get fresh manna tomorrow. Why is that? Why would people say, well, you know what? I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna put it in, I'm gonna put a freezer bag and I'm gonna freeze it. Why? why? They didn't have fridges in the desert, by the way. They hadn't even invented fridges yet. I'm just kind of riffing here. But why is it? Why do people have that? motivation. Well, it's this desire, and it's a very human desire, to hoard and to self-preserve. It comes from this idea, yeah, God provided today, but I don't know about tomorrow. I don't know. And then the second way that the people some of the people fail a test, is that some of the people go out on the seventh day because they just presume that there will be manna. There's been manna six days in a row on day seven, even if they said there's not gonna be manna, I bet there's gonna be manna, and when it's there, I'm gonna gonna go get it. And so they, they presume it's gonna be there. They take the manna for granted, and they don't see the value in trusting God enough to stop. Now, These two ways they fail the test. Where do they learn these ways? Remember, they're coming out of slavery in Egypt where they have been driven to produce bricks and earn bread. So it is just wired into many of them that they have to be concerned with self-preservation. Number one, Pharaoh and Pharaoh's men haven't been looking out for them. So they, they, some of them are tempted to hoard. And others, others have never experienced any such thing as a day off. They can't even imagine resting or stopping for a day. And so on day seven, it's almost impossible for them to resist going out and collecting manna. Now, here's the question for us. Here's the question for you. Based on the way you currently live your life, how would you have done in the wilderness? How would you have handled the manna? How would you have handled the Sabbath? Right now, do you currently live with a scarcity mentality? Do you struggle with anxiety, fear, worry? Would you be tempted to sneak a little extra manna into the Tupperware for tomorrow? And what about the day of rest? Would you have been able to stay home even if you thought there was some extra manna profit to get out there? If you just hustled on the seventh day, maybe get a little bit ahead. Now, it seems to me in our culture, in our American culture these days, there is a very strong drive to, first of all, make sure we have enough for ourselves, and second of all, to get more, right? Right? Look out for yourself and then get as much as you can. Those are pretty big currents in our culture. Got to look out for me and mine. And then I got to get more stuff, get more money, get more status, get more, get more, get more. But these two errors in our culture are the same two errors that are here in Exodus 16. And they're, they go all the way back to the book of Genesis, right? With Adam and Eve. This is what got them in trouble in the garden, The serpent said, you know what? God is stingy. God's holding out on you. You should eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve said, yeah, you're right. I I, I should really take my self-preservation into my own hands. Big mistake. 
And right along with it, it's not just their self-preservation they're taking into their own hands. They, they want to become like God. They want more. And those two things come together and they create the concoction of the first sin. And yet that same sin is working through human beings from then till now. And so in our story, Moses gets angry with the people who hoard and God gets angry with the people who go out on the seventh day. And so what we need to come back to is that word enough. Let God define enough. And there are two key areas in this passage that get very practical. The first is in our stuff, food, bread, possessions, material stuff. That all kind of ties in with the picture of the manna. And the second is with our time. And isn't it interesting that um, in our culture also, there is this drive to get more stuff. People always want more stuff. And there's this drive for more time. I need more time. I, I'm out of time, I, you know? So let's talk about the stuff lesson first that's connected to the bread, right? Their complaint starts off that we don't have enough to eat. And so we think that this is primarily about just what they have to eat. But then over in the book of Deuteronomy, we get a little commentary on what happens here. And there God is speaking, or Moses is speaking and talking about God's work in this story. And in Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, Moses says, God humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Hmm, this is interesting. So the manna here in Exodus 16, the manna they ate in the wilderness for 40 years was actually to teach them, it says here, that what they really needed was every word that comes from the mouth of God. There's a, there's a deeper reality than just the stuff in their clay bowl that they grind up or flatten out or boil or bake. That actually, in order to really be sustained, there's a spiritual need here that can only be satisfied by the words that come from the mouth of God. We're never gonna have enough stuff based on this passage until we understand that we're really trying to satisfy a deeper hunger. Now, this becomes especially clear in the New Testament because in John chapter six, Jesus feeds the 5,000. It's a very well-known story and the people love it. I mean, they're out kind of in the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It feels a little bit like a wilderness scene. Jesus feeds the 5,000 and the people, are there. they love it. And they start to say, is this the promised one? Is this the one who's like Moses? They, they begin to think that maybe Jesus is the promised deliverer from Deuteronomy 18 because he's fed them. So that night, Jesus walks in the water across the other side of the sea, as Jesus does. You know, Jesus loves to surf without a board. And then the next morning, the people wake up on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They're like, where's Jesus? And they find out he's back on the other side. So they come after him because they really want more bread. Listen to what Jesus says. Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, because you, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You're coming after me so that I might fill your stomachs, but you're missing the deeper spiritual reality. So the conversation continues and the people say to Jesus, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, you're still missing it. Very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. So they ask about this and Jesus says, the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And sir, they said, <laughs> always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Of course, later on in this very chapter, he will say to these crowds, you're gonna have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And it's hard, very hard. Most of the crowds leave. But if we follow this thread of manna from Exodus to Deuteronomy to here in the Gospel of John, we realize that the bread speaks to the spiritual need 
of the people and the spiritual need of the people is ultimately met by Jesus himself. Jesus is the one we need. Jesus is the manna. Jesus is the bread that satisfies. So when we think about resetting enough, when it comes to stuff, physical, material, possessions, what's in our belly, our appetites are actually longing for Jesus. And until we get Jesus, nothing will really be enough to satisfy us. But once we get Jesus, this is the amazing thing, we can learn to be satisfied in any circumstance. The Apostle Paul is the great example of this. Over in Philippians chapter four, he's writing from prison and he says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I have learned the secret of living at peace with enough. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul has learned to let God define enough when it comes to stuff. And enough when it comes to stuff starts with knowing Jesus at a spiritual level. And when you know Jesus in your heart, at a spiritual level, Jesus leads you into satisfaction, whether you've got a lot or a little, whether you are in want or you are in plenty. And that's important for us right now because I know in this season, we got people experiencing the full spectrum. What's enough? I mean, there are people struggling to make rent. There's unemployment like we've never seen before. People are losing jobs, businesses are closing. Other people are doing okay. But across that spectrum, actually, the question of enough when it comes to our stuff doesn't depend on how much is in your bank account or how much you're getting in your paycheck every other Friday. The question of enough is, do you know Jesus? Second lesson with time and the Sabbath, because the manna and the Sabbath are woven together here so beautifully. And the story of the Sabbath, of course, it goes all the way back to that creation story in Genesis when it says that God created the whole universe in six days. And then on the seventh day, God ceased. God stopped. God rested. That's what that word rest means. It means to stop. And the idea here is that when God stops on the seventh day, God doesn't rest because God is tired from all that creating, but rather it punctuates the creation process. God's saying the creation is complete. I don't have to go on tweaking and fixing and everything else. I have created and now I have stopped. And there's all this imagery in the book of Genesis around that Sabbath day that suggests that seventh day of God's rest is actually God just filling the universe that God has made. In the ancient world, when they would speak about a God resting, typically that meant that they believed, even the pagan communities, that the God was in the temple. Well, the creation in the book of Genesis is like the, the temple is the cosmos. And so when God is resting, it's like God is now here in the cosmos. Now, that sets the pattern for Sabbath in Genesis. It's very interesting because human beings are made on day six, which means that the seventh day, their first day, our first day, was a day of rest. But there's nothing else about the Sabbath or resting on the Sabbath until right here in Exodus 16. This is where God is going to help them reset their expectations around work, life, What's enough? When do you stop? And this is huge for them because as we mentioned, they've been slaves to productivity and brick making. And one day in Egypt runs into the next, 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 into the next. I'm sure there were plenty of times when they said, what, what day is it? And they're like, I don't know, Thursday, Saturday? Hmm, I don't know. Maybe you can relate to that feeling. And so God says right here in Exodus 16, I want you to take a day when you don't gather. I mean, you can try to gather, you can spend energy on gathering, but you're not coming back with any bread. It's not gonna be profitable. Anything you try to do on this seventh day is just gonna make me mad and you frustrated. God says here, cease, stop producing. You're a human being, not a human doing. 
And to me, it's interesting because a lot of our questions about what is enough in life in general, they're tied to time. So many of us feel like we don't have enough time. And the practice of the Sabbath here in Exodus 16, it says, no, enough, stop. Sabbath teaches us once each week, stop. And if it's the day when God moves into the world, then our activity is simply recognizing where God is. Eugene Peterson, pastor and author, he would talk about his own practice of the Sabbath. He had a very gracious way of talking about the Sabbath as a follower of Jesus. And and he would say, I would just focus on praying and playing. God's moved into the universe. So on the Sabbath day, I stop producing, stop gathering, stop trying to get ahead, just stop and recognize. Now, for these people, I'm sure it was busy around the tents because they're traveling with their families and they've got their leftover manna, but they don't have Netflix. They don't have video games or screen time. They might have a few animals with them. But really, like the Sabbath day for a lot of these families in the wilderness was probably fairly chaotic. But the thing that set it apart is that God said, no, don't gather, don't produce, don't do your main thing of working. You need to stop and listen and be present. Pay attention to your kids, pay attention to your spouse, pay attention to your relationships. Don't put extra time into cooking. That's all prepared the day before. Just be with your people. That's one of the challenging things, even in our own families, we've talked about what it looks like to try to keep a rhythm of rest one day a week. It doesn't ever feel like that day is restful because we're still parenting at 100%. But it's different. It's a different kind of rest because we've ceased from trying to produce. Amy's not going in to the hospital. I'm trying to take a, a break and a breather from my responsibilities specifically and my work here at Grace and we're, we're, we're trying to figure that out. It's not easy. You know, our students, it's interesting because our student team has been resourcing our students during this season to explore Sabbath. Since so many activities have fallen away, our student team is really wise. Kyle and Christy and, and, and the whole student team, they said, you know what? We've got some opportunity with our students to help them take advantage so that this time doesn't just feel like empty space, but actually begins to take some shape and people learn how to Sabbath and cease intentionally. And so for these last couple of weeks, their students, our high schoolers have been going through this and I asked them for some feedback. And one of the students said they'd always thought the Sabbath was just not doing anything. But then when they realized that there's an action to Sabbath to pay attention to God in the universe, it transformed it all. One student Sabbath by taking a break from social media on their Sabbath day, one whole day, took a break. And and the student said, the traffic slowed down in my mind. I didn't know I had been going that fast because my days look so slow during COVID. Another student said they were struck by how God rests. If God can rest, I probably need to also. This is a challenge for us. But, you know, when it comes to our time, when it comes to our identity, when it comes to our stuff, if we can't stop for a day in the week, We're going to wrestle with enough because every week stopping for a day is a way that we join in with God and we say that's enough for this week. When we talk about resetting rest, we're not just talking about resetting um, and focusing on rest because when you get the Sabbath right one day a week, then the work and the productivity, it kicks in for the other six. God says one day, one day cease from the regular stuff. Now, Jesus, just like with the bread, Jesus fulfills the Sabbath. In Mark chapter 2, this interesting scene happens. It says, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? They're probably thinking about Exodus 16. It's not manna, but it is grains of wheat. Come on, said the Pharisees. And Jesus has a conversation with them about, his identity connected to David. But then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And the point here is that day of ceasing is a day to pay attention to the Lord Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. 
And so for those disciples picking grains of wheat, they're not violating the Sabbath. Why? Because they're with the Lord, which is the whole point of that Sabbath day. So when it comes to your expectations of enough, let God define enough. When it comes to your stuff and your appetites and your accumulation, let God define enough through Jesus. When it comes to your time and where you put it, let God speak into the definition of what's enough in Jesus. Now there's some encouraging notes as we wrap up this talk. If you're struggling with grief or struggling with sin or whatever else, in this story, the people of Israel, they were struggling too. They were complaining like crazy. And yet God gives them what they need. God gives them enough. And if you're, if you're a seeker and you're kind of figuring out, I'm trying to understand God a little bit. I'm tuned in. It's Mother's Day. I'm watching because my mom wants me to watch, but uh, you know, I'm still not all in on God. God provides manna for them and it sustains them. I would encourage you to try looking to God this week and say, God, would you sustain me? Would you show me what it means to be enough? And for some of you who are seasoned and strong, you've been walking with the Lord a long time. This story of manna and Sabbath contains all kinds of invitations to know that great grace of God even more deeply. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for this story. Thanks for the way that you were kind to the people in the wilderness. And even when they're ungrateful, you provided. And even when they're disobedient, you kept making space for them to rest. And Lord, I pray for, for us as a community. As a, we're in a strange, almost wandering, maybe wilderness kind of time with lots of questions and anxieties. Lord, would you be kind to us? Would you help us know what is enough? Would we come to trust you and rely on you and be satisfied in our souls through our relationship with Jesus? Would our time just fall into the most redeemed rhythms we've ever known? Because you're the one who's shaping our schedules. Lord, I pray you'd bless moms, especially the moms who've been at home in this season and are tired. I pray you'd give them renewed strength and grace even today. In Jesus' name, amen.